thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I usually like to sit back and enjoy my introduction and say, you mean I'm really that good? <laughs> that I've done all these things? It's fantastic. Oh, a little over. Can you hear? There's people way up there. Usually I speak too loudly uh, because of my Irish. I'm only half Irish, but that's pretty loud. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and um, I'm delighted to come here and uh, say a few words, as, as they say. Um, I've been coming to Indiana since 1953 and working on the Miller House and other things, so I'm quite familiar with the area, although I've never been to Ball State before. I have to, I think I should tell you, can you, people here? All right. Uh, uh, at noon, I went to the Rotary Club in Columbus. Uh, the time before, I got the lines roar from the lines, uh, and I got my first job in architecture after uh, coming from the war. Um, I couldn't help, even though some people were there, I have to repeat, because I think it's a, a little funny. Um, when I went to the Rotary Club, they were having a big meeting about the University of Vermont, and they wanted, and the president was there, and they wanted to uh, get people to give, you know, like they always want you to give. And uh, so I couldn't help saying when I was introduced, I wasn't speaking or anything, I said, well, I gave my body to the University of Vermont, uh, and I gave my brain to Harvard, but Harvard didn't accept it. So I was back, so I said, well, I'll take my body back from Vermont. <laughs> I don't want my body out there without my brain. Anyway, uh, that was kind of a setback in the early days to find that my brain wasn't accepted, even though Einstein's was in Princeton. Uh, so ever since then, I've been a little more cautious and uh, not being quite so uh, ego, arrogant in my ego. Um, there's an awful lot to talk about in uh, the field of landscape architecture. Uh, and where to begin, I think the title that I said is, does indicate what I'm really excited about and interested in. I usually don't like to get into the seriousness of, you know, uh, philosophy of your work or, or this or that. I think basically, and I think that young people here, we said, you know, you should be loose, loose in life. You shouldn't be uptight and hanging on and, uh, and so goddamn serious. What's so serious about life? Life should be a joyful, like somebody says, a joyful cosmology. And you can't do anything really good unless you're with it, which is with nature. And uh, I like to, I say my whole life is dedicated preparing myself not to design, but to enjoy life. And by way of enjoying life, at the same time, you're in the area where things can happen from the best point of view. You never can do anything like Arrow Saren and used to do by grinding down in rolls of paper and making designs. Scarpa is the best architect. 
technically age. Not only this age, but go right back to the Renaissance and you won't find work like Howell's got so young. <laughs> when all the great architects looked at Howell's got
space in nature is that, you know, at this period, 18, 1986, we, under understanding of the world, nature, and everything is different than it was even 10 years ago, a rapidly increasing thing. And the thing that excites me about design isn't objects or things in space, but it's the thing of space itself. starts and it keeps going on and it never ends, it connects somehow ultimately to the universe. And this is the exciting thing about design. And I can't say too much more about that. It's spiritual, poetic, and it's a poetry of space. Not uh, not kind of a thing that you can grasp. Nothing that you can grasp. I get too deep in that, which I don't know too much about. <laughs> I better show my slides. Um, I want to show slides of the first uh, farm and uh, just I think it's nice to know how people live. And I say you in order to do your work you have to live uh, a good life. So you can margin showing this slide. This is where I, we live. See, there's my Morgan car. Uh, I hate cars and parking lots, but if they were all filled with Morgans, I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> and meanwhile, since then, I painted my Morgan white, which is even nicer. And that's the double pond. And my house is there, which you can't see. And that's the biggest white bridge. I'll meet you there because it's dangerous going. 
IBM, when they had the, they had everything worked out so perfectly well there. Uh, they wanted me to be there a day before my, my uh, lecture.
step through this thing is fairly
odds are you have methane gas in the soil. So you had a site, and I just said, geez, well, what can you do? And I told the candidate, uh, when I presented it to the candidate, I said, uh, uh, I think what we should do is make a grid of pipes and light the pipes, like the methane so you know, we have lighting, light lighting. Ted Kennedy said, make this. And anyway, that's the Rosa Ragosa, which can take the soul and the black, Japanese black pine and honey locusts. They all can take this condition. We had to put a lot of underdrain in, but still not enough. We still couldn't afford it because we can underdrain the whole thing without blowing the building. Anyway, it's like an unbelievable earth. It's not working. This is the most exciting job I've had to attend.
much. I'll be glad to. Uh... If, if you were responsible for the great revolution of art, what was the factor that kept landscape architects behind the work that they did? Why did they? Why, why did they? But is it the right way? I feel that modern architecture, when it started, had a fulfillment that could be rich, as rich and, and more real than postmodernism. Postmodernism is taking 
design ideas from the past and placing them willy-nilly around. You know, regardless of how wonderful a designer Michael Graves is, he still isn't in the right approach, I don't think. If he were in the right approach, this thing would be so much better. You know, because that's, that's not the way, you don't, I mean, they don't even make the Renaissance as good as the Renaissance was. You know, it's sort of fake Renaissance. Arches and, and uh, all these things that they do, especially uh, even worse than national park shows. You know, they, Michael Graves has columns this wide going up like this, ending up in a little dumb triangle up on top. Is that, that's clever, but it's not, uh, it's not real. It's ridiculous, I think. That's why we love anything real that, that uh, still works, just like uh, uh, farm instruments you have out on the farms and everything. They're beautiful. And not beautiful kind of period, but they're beautiful because they're honest and they, they say something. It has to be more than more than that in, in, say, in design and building. But you see the, the trouble with modern architects, the kind of international thing that we all looked at, was that uh, it didn't have enough film work, the strength of its ideas to still become that richness. Frank Lloyd Wright was the best one. education. Oh, you can be kind of snotty about that. It's a, just we get school. I think Frank Lloyd Wright said that, and, you know, a lot of people, but uh, no, I think school is very important. I think the best thing you
So you have to know everything you can. You have to know as much about engineering, as much about arch I'm an architect too, and it's helped me very much because I understand the problems more, and I have a feeling of the discipline of structure. And uh, trying to say enough, incidentally, I never got a degree, and uh, I, I fooled my way through being half Irish, as I said. I, I always got. Uh, registered through the grandfather clause or something. So I'm registered as an architect and a landscape architect everywhere without ever taking an exam. And I think Harvard still mad at me because I quit after two years and uh, didn't complete the course. And they're saying, oh, you're a fake. And they're probably right. <laughs> but I'm phasing out. It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, but knowing, that's the big thing schools can do you. Because you can learn in school can uh, uh, capsule it down into a shorter period, whereas if you worked in an office, it would take much longer to learn all that stuff. So the more you know, you know the more, if you're trying to get a job, the more you know, the more valuable you will be, and people will start to look. But if you could, I think drawing is the first thing to attract attention. Well, it depends on, you know, in a small office like mine, people have to be really draw beautifully and uh, be also, they can't be big deals like they know all the answers. I've had four people from Harvard recently, and I fired them all. Two of them were women, and two were men. And the pro they were good. They could draw, and they could design, and they could do, and everything. But they knew all the answers, you know. And it got us such a bore. I said, Jesus, we don't know the answers. We're trying to find out. And we don't go for that. We have to start the other way. So they. But I have now a wonderful office of people who are talented and also we have fun together, you know, because they don't, they don't have a big ego on their head. But I'm the only one who has to have that, <laughs> finally. Uh, in reference to what you said to plant material, uh, do you ever go back to a job Specifically, like uh, you mentioned Columbus, Indiana, let's say Saranen and your yeah. North Christian Church where you used Magnolia Solangiana so extensively. Yes. Do you ever question if that was really the right tree? Oh, no, never. <laughs> 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 no, I'll tell you about that, though. Is that, uh, you know, did you notice on the one side towards the road, they're beautiful, they've grown. Well, I about. Yeah, well, 10 or 15 years ago, I told Erwin Miller, I said, uh, you know, those things aren't growing. I think it's drainage mostly, but I said, let's rip them out. But I I don't know why they shouldn't do well, that's it. I mean, they do beautifully at Miller's, the ones we planted there. But you can't predict, there's a lot of things that you can't predict in that way. But. Um, but that still was the right tree. It, well, I mean. I don't mean soil wise, I mean look and blooming ability. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the idea of the church doing this, imagine this. I'll tell you what I told her. <laughs> Here's a spire, and then it goes like this. Then you're surrounded with a whole field of magnolias blooming, you know, around Easter time. You know, what more heavenly can that be? And there, the base, there used to be a cornfield there. 
And Kevin Rhodes said, we should just have the cornfield. But I said, in a few years, you won't have a cornfield, so we better do something. But, uh, you know, everything doesn't work out. You know, I'm not, many of the things I've done have been ghastly failures. <laughs> and, uh, that parking lot is superior. But the, the Arborvitae parking lot, I think, is superior. Yeah, thank you. And a lot of people have come. That's the way to do a parking lot is to screen the cars and a series of hedges. So the cars are in garden rooms. Instead of flowers in the rooms, they're cars, but you don't see them. And I've been trying to tell people all over the country to do it that way, you know. Yeah, I like that too. Yeah. Um, Newfix expressed the importance of um, freshness and looseness, and you said in your lecture that so much of lifestyle today is, is tense and full of tension. Um, to me, it seems like a lot of the role of the landscape architecture is just disguising that tension and providing places to get away from that. Um, a little freedom, a little quietness. Um, do you see an importance in, in a changing of attitudes or, or lifestyles? And if so, how do we go about doing that without being retroprogressive? Well, this is something you have to go back to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I mean, the values, our values and attitudes and everything have to come from a, a richer source. You know, we're too materialistic. I mean, America especially is very materialistic. You know, we're trying to grab everything in sight. We have even worse than England. And, uh, uh, and you don't have to have quiet places to go. You can be in very noisy and exciting places as long as you're having fun, you know. That releases your tension. You don't have to be in a budding grove way back in a little sylvan glade. You know, that's fine too. But as long as, for instance, here's a good example. Everybody loves Paris. And the reason they love it is you have boulevards. They used to be, the boulevard came from shooting a cannonball down, you know, as a defense. And they turned into avenues after they didn't have the function of being boulevards. And now you walk in Paris, you would only have to walk from here to there to sit down, have a drink and a snack. You know, every other, one after the other, there are places to sit down. And the people just throng and enjoy it. Uh, Americans, you know, for a long time, they gave you a big argument about Americans don't like to sit down outdoors. And now they're finding the opposite, finally. It's ridiculous to say that. So you're getting a proliferation of outdoor cafes and so forth all over the country. But um, I think uh, it's, you know, it, it comes from a deeper base. You can't all of a sudden change people's attitudes and get them to live, you know, live as well as I do. Like, I'm, and I still beat that corny thing up. Most of, I attribute it to the fact that I drink enough gin every day and have for 40 years. And I remember the very first uh, memory I had in Boston in Rafferty's Bar. My father took me in and I was about this high and I put my soft foot on a, a brass rail and he ordered me a gin laced with hot water and sugar when I was about four years old. And so that finally turned into something more substantial. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, I have, I don't like to brag, but my doctor said I had the lowest cholesterol rate he ever measured. And I said, well, the gin takes it right down your arteries like mercury, <laughs> right out. And if you believe it, it happens. <laughs> it's very part of your mind, you know. <laughs> And uh, I think the joy of life and, and celebrating the day and, and, and looking and enjoying everything and not making uh, everything such a crawling series. I love what Henry David Thoreau said. He was tempted to buy a farm. Uh, and then he, then he pictured himself you know, pushing the farm down with his nose down through life, supporting the farm. He never bought it, but he, he enjoyed it walking through it. So, and so I think lightness and trying to be in that area. I, you know, I make it a lot easier and joke and so forth, but I, I still also have to fight 
and get to try to get things done in bad situations, especially in bureaucrats and so forth. And um, and it's you know it's not all that easy, but uh, I still think you can put it on a better level than most. Well, as a uh, thing of that is that I always say when I miss the morning meeting in New York, I come in, I say, boy, I'm glad I made it for lunch. <laughs> But we won't eat inside, we go out and eat properly. <laughs> Otherwise, you get too tired. In, uh, in view of the fact that life and death are natural processes that affect the form that the landscape has, and uh, your landscapes have some very strong forms when they're first installed, how do you view the evolution of your landscapes over a period of time? And what do you expect them to do? From um, uh, I didn't quite get the question. I guess the, the question is in, that in the uh, light of the fact that many of your designs consist of very strong uh, rhythms or, or design yeah. elements, geometrical elements, and uh, life and death is a natural process in the landscape, how do you view the effect of those processes on your designs over a long period of time? Well, I, I evolved really after I got out of the aura of uh, Harvard with Gep, Echo and Rose, I kind of uh, straightened out very quickly. I, I did, my first job had every cliche that those people did. Everything, there were sawtooths and curves and everything in the first job I did. And I should have shown it to you because it shows completely different from what I do now. And so people say, why do you do this? I said, you want me to do what I did when I was 18 years old? You know, I'd gone through that. And this fake kind of copy of nature is the worst thing of all. And I just feel that man is very important and his measure of the land and his connection. We're working on a, a competition in St. Paul, from the capital area. And I'm thinking of a, a thing where you have rays coming out and then you have cross lines like a Mercator projection on the land. There will be a checkerboard of groves and stuff to kind of break down the terrible shapes that are there. Well, I don't know if I answered the question, but anyway. Right. Yes? Why don't we Wait. adjourn to the... Uh, she, she, uh, 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 okay. Leila wants to ask a question. Okay. I didn't, uh, do you want to, can you tell me, repeat a little? Uh, the At the very beginning of your career, yes. you had the opportunity of working with uh, broad-minded clients yeah. that allowed you to express yourself with uh, liberty. Yeah. What did that mean to you as a young person, and what kind of opportunity did that open for you? Well, they all weren't giving me that great an opportunity. I mean, we all had to, you know, I just didn't uh, want to do what anybody wanted to do. You know, I, it had to be a mutual uh, relationship with the client. I wanted him to be as open-minded as I was, hopefully, or that we both worked together. And if it didn't, if his arrogance is imposing something that I didn't believe in, then I couldn't take the client anymore. I had to drop. But I was lucky in that I had worked with all the best architects in the beginning, Lou Kahn, Eero Saarinen, Ed Barnes, and Harry Weiss, and SOM, all the people. You know, I had an unusual, easy opportunity because I was the only one in their area that they felt could help. So I think that's what it is. <laughs>